This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. Fast to freedom, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for September 13th, 2022. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find our podcast in the Voices of Wrestling Network podcast feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to uh, d- donate to the show, you click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box to sponsor this podcast and you set up a one time a reoccurring donation, no obligation whatsoever. And if you like what you hear, please go to Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you, you do that, and please give us a five-star rating or review. It helps us out a lot when people are trying to find out more about Dragon Gate. We want to pop up first. But I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears. Join alongside, as always, my co-host, Case Lowe. In case, I, I right before I hit start calls, like I have the energy of last day of school here. So this is going to be a pretty manic episode, I feel. Is this the is this a good time to start off by saying that a few weeks ago you had teased me and said you were ready to talk about something in your personal life and then we never got to it? Yeah, and did you notice something in the Slack today? I actually did do the little reveal here. So my uh my the lady friend, my girlfriend, does not care about wrestling whatsoever. Not part of her life, never was. She finds it interesting, like the politics she finds most interesting about it. I got texts out of the blue. Uh, a few weeks back by the way case sat on this for a couple of weeks just so you all know like and now he has a now he runs risk about revealing the insanity of this here. well so. it's just I, I i don't i don't know what the story is but i i know that whereas i am an open book and very loyal to our listeners and love sharing stuff about my personal life because i think it makes the show more entertaining mike spear is a very closed off man very secretive very very protective over his own image and i i didn't want to overstep my boundaries i knew mike had a story to share but i i wanted to provide the appropriate platform platform for him to share whatever story this is so this is the story of the first ever real wrestling conversation I had with my girlfriend. I get a text out of the blue case and it's, and she says, and it's a screenshot and it's of like a Buzzfeed or what have you like website listicle saying most, I, I wish I, I screenshotted the text, but it was the, the, the crux of the listicle was most rapid falls from heights, celebrities from rapid falls to heights. And she sent me a text and said, uh, a wrestler's on this list. Guess which one? And my thought would go to like a Hulk Hogan, maybe. Right. Yeah. I said like uh, Hogan, maybe, or something like that. I, I was like Hogan, you know, like he had a pretty bad f- quick fall. I mean, that was all over the news, Netflix documentary. No. Uh, did, did, all right. Now, case, okay, think about a little bit harder about what's the most obvious answer there. Uh, would it happen to be a wrestler who maybe just unfortunately passed a, a 15 year anniversary of his horrific deeds? Yes, that would be Chris Benoit. The old impromptu Chris Benoit text, a terrifying thing to pop across <laughs> your screen, I imagine. Well, I mean, it's something that like, I just no interest whatsoever. Like, um, like when I was going to all, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to wrestling shows for the weekend, like get content, you know, stuff like that. And I was like, Oh, I don't know if I really want to go to wrestling shows. I was like, oh, don't blame you. That's cool. And then out of nowhere, guess this. And then I explained the whole Chris Benoit thing. And then and then the conversation of, so is he highly regarded? Or like, how do you all like deal with this now? And I and all I can say is very difficultly. 
it is very, it, it people pretty much like art and artists if you really want to talk about chris benoit in 2022 and it was like oh that sounds like a bummer and, and then and then actually as a follow-up ne- next wrestler questions uh because of a podcast she was listening to it was about behind the blinds it was about the bella twins and i had to describe what why brian danielson is the way he is your mother is a huge fan of the bellas is that correct that is very correct. Yeah, total yeah. Bella. She she's the other the, other than Drew. You know, like we'll do content with me occasionally. That's all the wrestling thing is. My mom will, will ask. My mom would that convinced that Nikki Bella and John Cena was a fake relationship. By the way, yeah, I think. I mean, John Cena might be a fake human. I uh, he did not right. he did not come across well on that show. No, no, no. And apparently in the book, like. Nikki and Brie were talking about like, oh yeah, Brian's like really hippie and was like very firm in his belief about like not drinking. And then I explained like, so what's the deal with Brian Danielson? It's like, well, best wrestler of a generation. I had to do a poll last year. He finished ninth for me, but he's also a hippie. He's very well read. And you notice what words I did not include in that sentence case. I did nothing about his intelligence whatsoever. Because just like, why didn't you? He's well read. What's the thing of those? Like, he's someone who will randomly talk about in an interview that apples are a reproductive organs for plants. Like, I, I just Brian Danielson. So that that's been my life lately. Okay. The Benoit thing is interesting because yeah, I've run into that situation too, where people are like, oh, so he was like a scrub, right? Like it wasn't that big of a deal. And for me, it's like, no, he's actually my favorite wrestler as a kid. I actually did watch wrestling for like five years after the Chris Benoit story broke because it was very difficult for me as a child to process what happened. And then I, I a horrible decision. Don't, don't do this. I can't even say this facetiously, but I went back last year and I read the F four W's from the time of the Benoit stuff. And it is actually so much worse than I remember it. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't go read those. It is really, really awful but i i had a i i had a a woman over in my apartment this past weekend no grand hamada poster to be found but i do have plenty of other artwork up there i have a, a print of you know that famous photo of the obama administration when they're watching the bin laden raid go down oh yeah no the, the one where they like, everyone tried to find out who was the person that the movie seal team six was based off of right yeah. oh no i'm sorry zero dark 30 yeah, zero yeah, dark 30. They're, yeah. They're, like the whole obama administration is kind of huddled around this this table well i have that but of the looney tunes and their uh, the the name of the print is that they're like hunting down roadrunner so yeah i bring the lady over and i don't have an i don't have a universal lucha libre poster but i do have that to show her and she's like uh-huh okay cool no that's really that's really something and we're having a nice evening, a uh, third date, anything could happen. And in the, the midst of the evening, she looks over in the corner of my apartment and she sees the desk that I'm, I'm sitting by right now. And she sees the microphone arm attached to it. And she knows what I, I do for a living. And she goes, Oh, Oh my God, case, do you, do you do a podcast? And you know, I, uh, I crack the old fingers and I say, baby, do I, uh, <laughs> you know, well, I, I've done a few in my day and because, and this is, I, 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 you look, I thought, I thought the date went well. I, who knows if I'll ever see this woman again, nothing on the books right now, but she seemed very easy to impress. She's like, Oh my God, like you, you do a podcast. That's incredible. What's the podcast about? And that's when I got to slow the evening down. That's I, the, I, yeah I, i've i've developed a pretty beautiful sales pitch i think of like i'm actually like a, a historian i i'm i report okay. news like i do i i go through this whole thing of like you know uh you know drangate when the, so I, I i cover this company called drangate right and and they, they brought over english commentators a few years ago and i actually i helped i helped the english commentators put together the notes for the show i I'm like uh, internationally acclaimed businessman like i'm using terms like this to describe what i do and I, I i gotta say i think i sold it pretty well but she i was another one she's like uh-huh okay um i don't understand anything about your life everything you tell me is odd she asked me at one point she goes so do you just do you spend a lot of time thinking? And I, I said, I don't I don't know how to respond to that. I don't understand the question. She goes, well, I just you know, we've been on a few dates now and I ask you a lot of questions. Every question I ask, you have a very specific and thorough answer for. And it just makes me wonder if all you do is sit down and think about hypothetical questions all day. 
is that what I do? Yes. Is that what I told her I do? Of course not. But that is, she pegged me very early. She, she figured me out and realized that the, my entire life is preparing for hypothetical scenarios. And luckily for me, I have an answer uh, for, oh, do you do podcasts? I have a very detailed and thorough answer about how I'm actually like an international reporter and I, I'm covering a prestigious Japanese professional wrestling company. I mean, that's one way of handling it, bud. I mean, I'm I just like, upsell. Think- I can't just, I, yeah. you know, I, me and this dork from South Carolina do this podcast together. I can't do that. I've got to sell it a little bit. No, no, no. You, you're right about that. I'm just like right now thinking about how she pegged you immediately. And did you like notice like a tonal shift maybe like after she figured you out or was it just pretty much just like, oh, OK. It wasn't just like, oh, she figured me out and she knows she's figured me out, but I can't let her know that. Like, is it is a. It, it, that's like something that I feel like is like an infinite loop that would happen. You know? I, I didn't, I didn't notice a negative tonal shift at any point in the evening. Now, of course, during the podcast sales pitch, I'm going, you know, my friends at manscaped, my friends at hello fresh, the boys at draft Kings, you know, I'm throwing out these, th- these name brand sponsors, people that have attached themselves to the open, the voice gate podcast. She's got to know. I'm not just some, some guy in a basement. I'm not talking into a phone here. This isn't blog talk radio. I'm the voice wrestling podcast network. we got sponsors. How, We're a big hold, deal. Hold up. Hold up, you were like ten when Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was abnormal. Believe it or not. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Like I mean, that's like the the most shocking news here. Like you at ten <laughs> listening to Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> uh, all right. So on the program this week, at this point, I guess we should transition. As we talked about on Thursday, it is. Uh, Dangerous Gate is coming up, and it's coming up quick from, of course, Tokyo. Odyssey Gymnasium on the 19th. We will be doing our preview leading off, and we will finish up today's show. Everyone is – some people are on excursion. Some people are just on vacation. There's been a lot of Dragon Gate in the USA and in Mexico, and we're we're picking this week. I mean, we had a big-name debut happen, Case. Like, like this is – a lot of things are happening right now in Dragon Gate and across the world for like the first time. And I don't know, like I can't even really consider what happened with like Shun and Yoshioka. Like this is actually a time where it feels like Dragon Gate is actually representative in the hemisphere. Yeah, there's a global presence right now, which is nice. There is not the buzz in the sense of the buzz that we would get coming out of, you know, a Kobe world or a big pay-per-view. Like maybe, maybe we'll get this from dangerous gate next week where you, know, there's that big pay-per-view buzz where you get a lot of, ah, man, I've been meaning to check out dragon gate. Ah, should I, should I start with this show? So, so yes, yes. Just watch a fucking show and make up your mind. But there's definitely, I think just per capita, more dragon gate discussion with the guys in Mexico, with the guys in New York and, and obviously back home in Japan, there are some things happening right now, which is nice to see because, you know, even throughout the summer, I think that go home angle in July bombed so badly. And we talked about this with Jay when he came on the podcast where, you know, the, the road to Kobe world is normally the time where you get people asking about dragon gate more so than, than any other time of the year. And you and I do more content than we normally do. And Jay, over the past few years has done a great job of being the ambassador for the English brand. And after that July Corkin show, we were all just kind of like, well, all right, talk to you guys in August. And it seems like maybe the energy that could have been spent there is now being put into uh, the energy here mid September. So it's, it's nice to see. It's been a, a very fun and busy few days within uh, the dragon system. And no day will be as busy as this Monday. And even with MLW, all kinds of stuff happening in Dragon Gate, in the Dragon system, in the Dragon Gate world, no match will loom have a bigger presence and loom large over Dragon Gate than the Open the Dream Gate Championship match that we will have on Monday. Yuki Yoshioka versus Eita. It's the first promoted defense for Yoshioka, but it'll be a second defense since he won on the first night of Kobe World Weekend last week. And yeah, it, it, it's something that like all these things are happening. And at the same time, we have what could be seen as like this huge, like generational uh, Dreamgate match happening on Monday. Yeah, this is a, a show that that hopefully this podcast itself, this episode gets the ball rolling on this dangerous gate buzz, because it was a show that I obviously had circled on my calendar. I was well aware that it's coming up. Brief programming note, Mike Spears will be handling the written review over at VoicesWrestling.com, and 
my schedule TBD. I might not even be on the podcast next week. Professionally, next week is a, a very busy week for me. So I don't know the last time, and this is more just for my own vanity rather than anything that anybody cares about. But, you know, obviously the two night pay per views, Champion Gate and Kobe World, we split those one night each. I don't remember the last time that I didn't review a standalone Dragon Gate pay per view. So, I'm very excited to be in a different position as a viewer. I'm excited to read your review. Uh, if I'm not on the show next week, then obviously the week after I'll, I'll give my brief thoughts on it. But sitting down and formulating my thoughts on all of these matches, and I do have a lot of thoughts on most of this card. This is a sneaky good show. This is this is not a sexy Dragon Gate show. There, there's those every once in a while where there'll be a special singles match in the middle of the card, and maybe there's like a really hype Triangle Gate match with some big names in it. Those stand out on paper. This is not one of those shows, but especially if you're clued in, if you paid attention, you watched the last Osaka show, you watched the last Corkin Hall, there is stuff up and down this show that really matters, and the business end of this card, I think, has far more depth than I realized when it was first announced. Yeah, I, I guess we didn't do an initial impressions before I started talking about Ata versus Yoshioka, but it, it, it's something that we only have three title matches, and it's something that they've been very pointed of the use of the Brave Gate title, especially since 2019. So the fact that Kyo is not defending like where that very easily could have been a, a match they would slot in as an opener, you know, especially with the YouTube presence, you, you'd expect that. But now you take a step back, you have three title matches, and then I would consider two of the five undercard matches actually like pretty heavy storyline stuff. So when, when like I take a step back and look at it, I mean, five out of the eight matches announced have a lot going into it. And especially it feels like that's not like a standalone card where sometimes the undercard does very much feel like, okay, this, these are the pieces we have left of the units that, that aren't defending title belts. So let's get them in here. There's actually like, good story happening in some of these undercard tag team matches, which is something that I feel like Dragon Gate hasn't necessarily done as much in recent years. So big picture thought here. Last year in this building with Yamato versus Kota Minora as the headlining match, Dragon Gate did 15-10. At DDT for their Peter Pan show, they just did 12-50 and claimed a super no vacancy for that show. In July... Stardom did 1527 for one of their shows, and I did not get the attendance on the second show that they ran. I know they ran two shows back to back there. Uh, the G1 Climax in uh, this building, Oda Ward City Gymnasium, Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Tetsuya Naito did 2518, and Jay White versus Tomohiro Ishii did 1919, and Jake Lee versus Kento Miyahara in All Japan in June did 1398. I know I just threw a bunch of numbers at you. The big one to circle here is, of course, last year, Drangi did 15-10 in this building with Yamato versus Coach Minora. What is your expectation attendance-wise for this year's show with Yuki Yoshioka versus Eita? So it goes with saying, when we talk about the DDT number, DDT had a cheering crowd, so that capacity right. yes, right. was limited. So when, when you see like 1,300 for that, it's in the context that, and this is the other side of the equation when you have clap crowds is, you're agreeing to cap yourself, whereas New Japan and the G1 for these shows did not cap them, but they're more than willing to do the uh, clap crowd uh, cap for Cork and Hall, but not for Odyssey Gymnasium. That's just something I wanted to just clarify off the bat before we start projecting. Um, I think the band I would like to see out of them I would like to see uh I, I think there will be a little bit of the climb because it's cause Yamato there in that building that helps and Yoshioka. This is the real test of Yoshioka as a draw, really. So fourteen hundred sounds about right. Maybe I, I the my band of expectation is fourteen to sixteen hundred. So that's right around where they were last year. But I expect it to be lower than that, I guess. So maybe thirteen to fifteen hundred is what I'm expecting. I'm of the opposite thought process. I think Yoshioka is catching on as champion. You know, we came out of those really depressive July shows where Kobe, uh, Kobe Sambo Hall was really down. Osaka was down. Obviously, the two shows at War Memorial Hall, those were down. 
And then once Yoshioka got the belt, we saw a big spike in August attendance, both in Osaka and in Tokyo. And then September bumped those numbers as well. So we've seen a month and a half of objective growth with Yuki Yoshioka at the top of the company. I expect them to do a little bit more than 1,500. I don't expect them to touch 2,000. If they touch 2,000, it is pop the cork level numbers. It is everybody in that room from Genki to Rio Saito to Ultimo to whoever else you want to believe is backstage. It is high fives all around. It is let's go celebrate in Rapongi. Let's go have a good time. I don't think they're going to touch 2,000, but I feel like Yoshioka versus Eita is a stronger match than Yamato versus Minoru was last year. And this is Minoru when I, and, and from my perspective, he felt very hot and I was very into that character. But I, I think Yoshioka versus Eita at this point in time was a bigger match. I just, it, they put the belt on Yamato for a reason to do that kind of number. And even though Eita, it's kind of hard sometimes to judge if Eita, but Eita, if he's not 1A or 1B, he's right up there. So you're basically saying that with this match, two guys that are in between basically Yamato and uh, Kota Minora in box office presence, for lack of better words. And w- that's what you're proposing is that these two together are better than the highest of highs of Yamato along with the unprovenness of Kota Minora. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I, you know, what really stood out to me was they drew a thousand fans for this show in 2020. And that is the height of attendance restrictions. You know, that is still very with the, cage. It, w- with the cage, very early in the pandemic, they drew a thousand fans to this building. And I was really taken aback when I saw that number today, because I kind of just assumed that that number would have been like 700 or eight or 700 or 800, or in the case of what Noah did earlier this year in this building, 900, I was really surprised to see that number. It was 996, so basically out of 1,000 fans. I think if they're doing anything under 1,300 for this show, it is a break-the-glass, panic-button type number. I, I really am bullish on this show. And it, look, if it's 1,300, 1,400, 1,500, I, we'll, we'll call it a win and move on. But I think there's something to this show. I, I, I think it's going to do a really respectable number in part of that reason, and Mike, this is a question that I want to ask you, and, and take a second to really think about this. Can you name all of the Open the Dreamgate Championship matches that Ata has been in? Okay, so this is his first one since dropping the belt, first and foremost. So then it was Ata versus Shin Skywalker, Ata versus KZ, Ata versus Doi. Then things get really foggy at that point. That's the thing. Th- think about that timeline for a second. You've got the you've got the three from his title run, the Doi match, which I was just thinking earlier today. I I so badly wish 2020 wouldn't have been interrupted because I really would have liked to have known what Doi versus Ata in Kobe for the Dreamgate belt. I really would have liked to have known that number because that match felt like a huge deal. And that was right out of the, pan- you know, right, right when shows resumed from the pandemic. And that was in Wakayama and that match still felt like a huge deal. And then he had the KZ defense and then eventually lost to Shun Skywalker. Can you think of any Ata Dreamgate matches before that Doi match? I don't think he had one. I think that was his first one. Exactly. That was his first one. Think about what H has done in Dragon Gate. Think about how he's been there for a decade now. Really, the I mean, the Millennials just landed nine years ago. He's been a mainstay focus for nine years. He has been in three open the Dreamgate championship matches. And realistically, for the last five years, we can point to him at times as the 1A, at times as the 1B, at times as the 2, but he's been a player. He's been in the ball game for a prolonged period of time. And you think about the trials and tribulations that Drangate went through in 2018, the instability they faced in 2019, and then obviously the move to put the belt on him in 2020, which I believe was planned long before COVID ever happened. The patience and the restraint that they have shown with Ata as a dream gate contender slash champion is remarkable. There's I, now, I don't think Ata is going to win this match. I'll tip my hand right now. I don't think Ata is going to win this match, but there's money matches up and down the roster. If they decide to pivot to Ata here, he has been so protected for it, It's, it's a strange situation in that 
a lot of the time when Ata was leading R.E.D., I felt like he was overexposed and that I was seeing too much of him. But if you put him as a singles main eventer, all of a sudden it opens up this entire world of possibility of matches that really haven't been touched. And I think Ata headlining this show is a big deal. It feels big. The chemistry between he and Yoshioka on these Road 2 shows has been terrific. Yoshioka, just by definition, the, the little bit of evidence that we have of him holding the title and houses going up, this feels big. I am into this match. And it's something, really, with Ata. Like, when we talk about, like, in the greater scheme of things, talking about the extent of his entire career... Really, it was until uh, R.E.D. truly that he actually was like treated as that kind of figure. So you still have the fact that he, there is a level of newness here, even though there's times that he's kind of completely omnipresent in a way. I, I, I guess like the, the one thing that I would pose to you, Case, is is this about as much as you can do with Ata right now before you make some changes to Ata, who he's associating with, or like, is this like Lone Wolf Peros Ata? Is this really kind of it? Because that's kind of a feeling I'm getting. And I know that's coming from me who thought Ata was just going to have the big box office that you were talking about for like this kind of year. So I, I, I guess I'm wondering, to rephrase that case, I guess I'm wondering, is this kind of like the peak of Ata in his stage is to be in this kind of big main event match, big five show against a relatively unproven kind of commodity in Yuki Yoshioka. Him being a lone wolf up to this point in time, and I'm looking at the time frame of end of July when Peros lost the Triangle Gate belts through now, it has not been a hindrance. Now, there are things about it, and I've, I've expressed this on the podcast of, you know, you've got Yoshioka who came into this build as a tag team. Now he's got a third partner there in Kakuta. And you've got Ata who doesn't have anybody right now. And it's created some strange matchups, but some matchups I've enjoyed nonetheless. I mean, I certainly didn't expect when, if you would have told me July 31st that the direction is Yoshioka versus Ata, I was not expecting Yoshioka, Daya, and Kakuta versus Ata, Jason, and Jackie to headline a Cork and Hall show. And for that Cork and Hall show to do a very, very good number. But that is the reality that we're living in wishfully thinking of course i hope that ata has a change in direction after this show of course i want him to join a unit and feel more like a drangate wrestler than an outside wrestler who happens to be wrestling in drangate i think there's like a 60 40 maybe 55 45 chance that that happens i could very easily see a timeline in which we're dealing with lone wolf ata at least through the rest of the calendar year that wouldn't shock me in the slightest especially with the unfortunate noah drangate crossover show coming up I tend to think this is the end part of a story for Ata, and that going forward, he's going to go back into the unit shuffle. He's going to go back into feeling like a Dragon Gate roster member, but I don't know for sure. It could really go one way or the other. Yeah, I guess that's kind of where I'm at at this. If I were to guess, I'm probably 50-50 at this point, I, I, because at this point, really, with how the shakeups are going, this is something that, like, the unit battleground might only be settled in 2023 at this rate. So I could easily see him, as you were saying, make it all the way to the end of the year as a lone wolf. Uh, I I guess like the other like big point about this Dreamgate title match in a way is I, I kind of feel like that like this in concert with the Twin Gate, this is the decourage referendum. And we've seen houses, as you've mentioned, go up and Really, the thing that I've noticed that's kind of like peak, that's really like kind of peaked up over like Cork ends and shows that they are able to really show the crowd is the amount of decourage support here. And I, I guess like the thing I'm really interested about the show in a way that like there is definitely a reality. I don't know how certain it is is for this Twin Gate Championship, but there's a definite reality that we could be looking at decourage and Kakuda walking out of this building completely built it up and just like being the complete focus point of this uh, company. And I find that really fascinating that like the, the going in this direction in this manner, and it's kind of done contrary to the usual dragon system side of like, okay, no, this is really a tag team up top. Kakuda, he is a member, but he's not a full member. He's, this is not a unit. This is a tag team. I think of that. This in a way is kind of the big through line for this entire pay-per-view is 
to kind of say like this is the courage here they are they've been our main characters this year let's see how they are up top you know dragon gate is not a t-shirt company and it's not the best metric to use but what do we hear from people in japan we hear decourage shirts move at a rapid rate and we know from stories that have been told on this podcast that Ata is a phenomenal merchandise mover these are stars right now this decourage thing and credit to dragon gate the at this point, we're going on three years of Dia Inferno coming in, attacking Dragon Dia, and the through line to now. This has all been a success story, and and I don't know if we have given them the credit. You know, we obviously throw a lot of roses at Dragon Gate on this show, but especially if this show works and this show is a box office box office success, we have to really take a step back and appreciate the work that they've done for Yoshioka and Daya with this long-term feud turn partnership, because by all accounts that we have now, and maybe by this time next week, when this show does 900 fans and, and, and it's a total bomb and the main event isn't even any good, I'll issue a retraction. But with all of the evidence that we have up to this point of the time we're recording the show, this D courage stuff has worked. And in my eyes and in my gut, it has worked as well, and I, I, I think that goes a long way. And I, I, I'm of a similar mind. I know you kind of slid in your A to prediction here. I think this is something that right now with Yoshioka, especially right after Kai, you want to have this be his defining, not necessarily career-defining, but at least at this stage of his career, defining him in this echelon. And I think that being able to have one of Ada's rare Dreamgate title matches and being able to get that win here I think that when you look at the back half of the year, I think that is the kind of uh, uh, stability maybe is the word about like making sure that what you can do to have a stable kind of route forward for Yoshioka. And I think that's what we get to see coming out of Dangerous Gate. Assuming he wins here, and and I, I assume that Yuki Yoshioka is going to get the W, although I can't entirely rule it out, and we'll discuss that in just a second. Assuming he wins and the thought process that I've been under is that he'll beat Ata and then beat Ben K at Gate of Destiny in Osaka. And that's not only beating Ben K, who in a very physical sense is very impressive and is obviously a former Dreamgate champion, but he has a chance to defeat Ben K, who has the most momentum he's had in three years and has a character that is really catching on now. If those two steps happen, they have done everything possible to set Yoshioka up for success, not only in the immediate future, but I think that is a run that will gift him just a lot of power and respect as time goes on. They have a chance to really set him up to be somebody special. I fully expect that to be the case, but it's also Ata in this company's weird, and like I just talked about, they really haven't explored Ata as the Dreamgate champion. And so I can't rule it out. I feel like it's like a 70-30 Yoshioka retained split. Yeah, I, I think 70-30 is fair because I can't discount it out of hand. I mean... No, it, it's... it's You really can't. And if anybody's thinking, well, it's of course they're going to have Yoshioka win, it, it's just, it's not that simple. First of all, he's already got a defense, so he's not a zero-key champion, which is, you know, something that they obviously want to protect him against. But it's just, it's Ata, and Ata is weird, and the way they handle him is weird. And I don't even think it would be a flaw if he won. It would be one of those, and I don't have a, a specific example in mind, but it would feel a little bit like, like giving the world heavyweight title to John Cena, where you have this young guy with all this momentum and you really want to see where he goes. And, and his reign is far more interesting than anybody else that can hold the title right now. But if they give the belt to Ada, it's like, okay, he's he's your 1B. He's a reliable draw. He's doing work in all of these other companies right now. Like, I, like shoulder shrug, I get it, even if I don't like it. So it's not the end of the world if Ata wins, although I'm far more interested in Yoshioka continuing his run. Yeah, and... For the company, I think it's something that even though Ata and these other companies, like having him carry around the belt, like there is a level of stewardship and a little bit of him being their representative that makes sense. Like as you have, as you said, you shrug about it. I just think that in, unless they're completely blowing up how this like family of promotions is operated for the greater part of a quarter century, having Ata as Dreamgate champion is just something that 
what do you do with him then like it's some like that's like why i've brought that up a lot is it's just because of how the company constructed like are you really going to want to have dates on nasawa wrong guy for the next year to be able to do this so he can be in a tag team match in kyoto no so like it's something that maybe i'm talking myself actually to about 80 20 at this point maybe maybe actually 80 15 now that i'm really worked up about it it's weird because I think as time goes on, I think as we get closer to this match, I'm going to be closer to 70 or to 60, 40, where it's just like, well, it is Ata. They do really like Ata. You know, Yoshioka is unproven, but I, I, I think there's been a level of care and a level of detail with Yoshioka. This, this will sound funny in, in a blanket statement kind of way, but you have to remember he is the guy that beat Kai and that is, Kai was so protected and so powerful as Dreamgate champion. They didn't just give that to anybody. You know, it, it's there's a reason Big Boss Shimizu, for as much as I love him, there's a reason that he didn't pin Kai in the championship match. They gave it to Yoshioka. He thwarted Minora the next night, gave himself a lot of goodwill with these fans. I think they care about him. I think he's a long-term project. I think so far in the short term, he's been a success. But it is Ata. And ultimately, the only way I can describe it is that Ata is weird. Well, then we have uh, Yoshioka's team partner in D Courage. He's teaming with Madoka Kakuda. Dragon Dai and Madoka Kakuda will be making the first challenge of the Open the Twin Gate champions of the Kung Fu Masters of Jackie Funky Kame and Jason Lee here. And the, I am actually like moving myself to a coin flip about this match, guys, because I can honestly see. Like, ever since I brought the idea of all three of these guys having belts, now that's in my mind, I, I feel like that that could be a very distinct possibility. At the okay, so uh, w once again, I, I like this because I don't, I don't feel that way. Uh, I, I think pretty confidently I feel that Jason and Jack are going to retain these belts, surely for the fact that they're wrestling as the Kung Fu Masters, and I don't think they would bring the Kung Fu Masters out here. They're probably going to lose their undercard match. I don't think they would have them go 0 for 2 when they made such a big deal about these guys wrestling in Tokyo. And then you have the odd sort of tandem here of Kakuta and Daya. They're in the same unit. They're not in the same unit. I don't know. I think this will be a, a successful V1 for the Twin Gate champions. Yeah, I, I guess like the way that like, with the way that D Courage is right now, like by the end of this podcast, I'm going to be like the number one D Courage fan. <laughs> I, I'm just building myself up more and more about them. I just, it's just the image of like being able to like, they're the ones that have been closing the shows every single night and be able to have all of them have belts on it. I think that's something that I can't discount here. But yeah, with Kung Fu Masters and what we'll talk about in a bit about natural vibes here, definitely feels like it. Two guys have something going on whereas the other four are kind of almost not, not like in a death spiral but they're definitely like setting it up for like a situation of stakes that natural vibes could very easily not be here at the end of the year whereas kung fu masters could be the solidified like baby face unit that we've been speculating about since they announced that kung fu masters will that kame and and lee will defend as kung fu masters not members of natural vibes yeah, I will maintain the thought process that I've had on this show for the past few weeks, which is I think they're going to make Kung Fu Masters a pretty big deal. I, I think they're going to win here in Tokyo. I think they will show up in Osaka on November 3rd or whenever Gate of Destiny is, and I think they'll wrestle there and they'll defend the titles there. And I think this is a unit that suddenly is going to be a full-time unit, and we will see the removal of natural vibes for, in one way or another. The scenario of D-Courage winning, I think, is interesting, assuming that Yoshioka retains as well, because at that point, I think you have to do a triangle gate match. I think you have to do Yoshioka, Daya, and Kakuta versus M3K, and I think that could that could be a really big match. I mean, that that is Cork and Hall main event worthy if there ever was a match. I don't think there's ever been a scenario like that where a Dreamgate champion and a Twin Gate team have challenged for the triangle gate belts. I think that's super interesting. I just don't see that being the route that they take. Yeah, and that is the other side of the coin, is if you built up all of the courage, then how are you going to like really keep the other units looking very strong when then it's just the Triangle Gate floating around and the Brave Gate? Then like you can't say, oh, the Triangle Gate champions, that represents the strongest unit in Dragon Gate, the unit warfare field. Whoever holds the belts currently in the lead 
you can't necessarily say that if one unit has all the belts. So, yeah, like that is the other side of the coin here. I I, I do wonder if we're going to kind of see this like takeoff of Kamei and Lee. They've already had one five star match this year as challengers. We've we've seen Jay, we've seen Jackie and Jason like have like these performances here, and it's something that you've really. I look at this match. It's like, oh, you're saying the this tag team champion run to be an actual run here because uh, hey, you like look at these four guys and it's like there's no reason that this match should not succeed like this is the highest floor match that i feel like dragon gate has had in a while yeah this is third from the top this is going to get time this is going to be a really big deal and it's funny you look at it from the perspective of Jason and Jackie being, you know, at this point, a pretty legitimate tag team, because I was looking at Dragon Daya in the year that he's had. And obviously, you know, he had the tremendous match with Takuma Fujiwara at the first night of Champion Gate. But you look at Dragon Daya's year this year, and I'm somebody who votes on the FSM 50. And obviously, my, my list is slanted towards Dragon Gate. And Daya, as well as Jason and Jackie, but Daya are, is going to do very, very well on my list this year. He's got that Fujiwara match. He's got the Twin Gate defense versus Eita and Maria and Hyo and SB Kento from the next night. Obviously, there was the great Dead or Alive tag with him and Yoshioka versus Diamante and Shun Skywalker. Mike, do you remember January 22nd of this year, Dragon Daya and Yuki Yoshioka versus Kagatora and Takuma Fujiwara? Because that match was outstanding as well. And then you've got, you know, uh, decourage six mans and, and whatnot all throughout my spreadsheet this year. Dragon Dio with another really strong match is going to put himself on that upper tier of wrestlers in 2022. And it's with two guys we already know he has immaculate chemistry with as well. Like that's like the other side of the coin about this. It's like, oh yeah, no, Dia and Jason basically have been teaming since Dia came into the company, if you really think about it. And it's like, oh yeah, no, we've seen him and Kame. Like that's going to work here. And I'm the, the thing the the pairing I'm most intrigued in this is Kame and Kakuda because they have done a little bit of stuff like when Kakuda returned, he teamed with Kame and they they showed a level of chemistry that like for a while I was like, oh, there could have been something here. Or this might be something worth revisiting. But I think there's like a natural chemistry between those two that for Kakuda, who's really have has found himself over the last 45 days, I think this is something that only will like lend it to his ascent is this pairing with Kamei. We've seen far more of Kamei and Kakuta teaming with one another than we've seen them wrestling one another. And these are class of 2020 guys. This is the original, I guess not even the future class. These are guys that predate the future class. And with SB Kento out of the country, with Takuma Fujiwara out of the country, I think these guys are going to be on a mission. That You are exactly right, Mike. Those are the guys to watch in this match. For as good as Jason is, and for as good as... Uh, um, who's the uh, uh, for, who's the fourth guy in this match? It's Daya, Kakuta, Jason. Who am I forgetting? I, 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 you, you were complimenting Jason. I feel like you were about to compliment Daya. Yeah. Uh, oh, D- Daya, yes. For, for as good as Jason and Daya are... This is a match that is going to be Kamei and Kakuta centric. These guys are going to get time with one another. And I, I fully expect, like you said, they, they've alluded to having great chemistry in the past, but now it is really going to be showcased, I think. And the other title match that we have at Dangerous Gate is for the Open Triangle Gate Championship. There's a little bit of confusion about this one. It is M3K, Masaki Mochizuki, Susumu Mochizuki, and Mochizuki Jr. defending against Ishin Riki and Ishin Hashi, along with Don Fuji. And the confusion is that in the setup, they had Don Fuji impersonate a supposed sister of, of Ishin Hashi's mother, Ishin Riki's wife. And he came out in drag here, and they made a reference to that there. But in every single official communication, both in English and in Japanese, I've seen it as Don Fuji. So I know that's a fear that people have about this match. I just think that... It was a it was a bit to pop the crowd, and now it's going to be Don Fuji on Monday. I hope you're right. Uh, that is something that we will be working under the assumption of that this will be a traditional Don Fuji match on the Gaiora website. This is listed as the semi main event. This is second from the top, and that is exciting for me because I think this is the night. One year into Ishinihashi's career, remember last year he debuted at Dangerous Gate with his brother against Yasushi Kanda and Don Fuji. 
This is going to be the Ishin Ihashi show. I think they are going to look to basically pave the way for Ishin's next six months in this match. Do I think he will win? No. Do I think it will be a mistake if he, his father, and Don Fuji leave for the Triangle Gate belts? Absolutely. This is a match where Ishin Ricky needs to take a kick to the head from Mochizuki Jr. and lose and then clear out because his son has a bigger, brighter future ahead of him. I do not believe that uh, the Sumo family and friends are going to win this match. I just want to say it up front. But I just have to say, if you are booking to my interest, having a 60-year-old executory, his son, and then their drunkard friend from down the street is right up my wheelhouse, guys. Right up my wheelhouse. You know, I, I was talking on this show like three or four weeks ago, and I said, God, you know, they, they really haven't explored the Don Fuji versus M3K relationship, but I think that's a really interesting path to go down. And assuming we get traditional big match Don Fuji here, I think that's going to be thrilling because I think Fuji's going to want to pick a fight with Mochi Jr., and I think that's going to put Masaki Mochizuki in a really interesting position. Then obviously, you look at what Mochizuki and Ishin Ricky as the older guys can do, and then you got to remember the fact that Ishinihashi wants to kill Mochizuki Jr. and that their chemistry has been phenomenal with one another. So there is a lot going into this match when you dig in even a layer deeper. It, this is one where, you know, star rating wise, which is probably a poor way to preview a match, there's, there's a high ceiling and a low floor here. This is one where I, I could see this being, you know, a vintage Don Fuji performance and the rookies go out there and kill it and we're slapping four and a half on this thing and moving on to the main event. It could be also a really good three and a quarter star match. And I, I it, again, it's a poor way to frame matches before they happen, but there's just a lot going into this and a lot that could happen. It, it's variance. The, it, it is something that what is to say Don Fuji decides to wrestle this match completely in drag as uh, the, the supposed uh, aunt of Isha Nahashi. Like that can you, that could very easily happen. And that's when we're talking about low floor with this, but I just like look at this match and one thing about talking about this match as we're saying is this is Masaki Mochizuki who considers like Oda City and Tokyo. He is from Tokyo. This is his hometown. Each time that the, I remember we had a conversation with Jay about this and it's like, oh yeah, no, he considers every time you go to Cork and Hall, you're stepping on his home turf here. But you have like, so you have the Mochizuki's already Tokyo based guys. There was a presence for Ishin Ricky at Cork and Hall here. If you're looking for a way for this show to post a surprising number, let's see how many uh, people come out for this match because they go to the Ahashi's restaurant because that, that is a distinct possibility here. Yeah, no, this is a big match. I mean, I talked about this last week when we recorded a little bit later in the week, but the Mochizuki Mochizuki versus Ihashi tag match was the only thing announced for that September Corkin and it did 1100 fans and it's obviously not entirely because of that match but if you think there's not support here for that main event a section of fans that's buying a ticket to go see this and I think you're sorely mistaken I think this is a big draw on this show more so than the twin gate match even if the twin gate match is a little bit more appealing on paper yeah so I think like the, a, a good way to kind of like phrase this in a way is I think this is a match that there might actually be like a cultural disparity because I think that it's going to be something if you're parachuting in for this, you're like, oh, it's M Misaki Mochizuki and it's going to be a lot of fathers and sons. Like, what's the deal with this? And you're talking about like the, low, the lower star ratings you were before. But I could very well see this being a match that people in the building be like, no, people are going crazy for this. Like, this was so hot. Like, you had all these people here in Ishin Riki t shirts and then all the people here in the Mochizuki M3K t shirts. Like, that was definitely like a draw here. I could see that happen with this match. Yeah, I, I, I think this is, I mean, look, like I said, on the Gaiora website, this is second from the top. This is not, you know, a random collection of guys triangle gate match. This is, this is an important match on a big show, and it is being treated as such. And those are the three title matches we have on Dangerous Gate. There still are five undercard matches. Let's talk about the ones that actually have some meat on the bone here. It is high-end versus gold class. It's the first time we get to see the full four-man trio together as it's Yamato, Dragon Kid, Akaka, Tora, the three remaining members of high class versus Kota Minora with Minorita, Naruki Doi, and the newest member of gold class completing the four-man trio, Ben K. If I have it my way, Ben is spearing Yamato out of his boots in this match. I, I think this is... 
you know, th- this is, again, if you're clued in, if you're paying attention, this is not just a collection of guys. This is a match that matters. And I think there's a very good chance that the finish of this match will tell us who the next Dreamgate challenger is. Yeah, and it's something that I think that really for, like, for gold class, for whatever it's going to be going forward, and it's something that, I mean, it it, it, it seems so hot and it seemed like it came together, but then you take a step back and you're looking at the summer and it sputtered out here. And it it really is something that, that, that Bing K needs to be able to definitively get gold class some momentum in the in the forward direction, whereas it looks like there, there's nothing that high end gains out of winning in this match, whereas gold class could really use it. No, I would be stunned if high end won. I mean, there's like like you said, there's nothing there. There's nothing there for them. Gold class has the momentum. Ben K specifically has the momentum. You know, Kakatori could get pinned. Dragon Kid could get pinned. Yamato could get pinned, and it would mean something. Like, yeah, there's no there's no reason for high end to have their hands raised at the end of that. Yeah, and it's something that I think will kind of move out of that. And I think that this kind of match works in concert with the. Uh, with the eight man tag that's ha- that was booked, this is Natural Vibes, KZ, Big Boss, Shimizu, UT, and Strong Machine J versus the remaining members of Z Brats, Kai, BB, Hulk, Hyo, and Diamante. Look, don't let anybody tell you different. This is where the business end of the card starts. This is the big match. Uh, this is all out war style, two units that have been feuding, two units that are more than capable of putting on a tremendous match, even at this point in the show. Do not get fooled here. This is good stuff. I think the the possible results of who takes the fall and what that could mean are so interesting because if it's natural vibes losing and KZ takes the fall, all of a sudden I think we're going to be on a really expedited process to some sort of unit disbands match, some sort of big game-changing natural vibes unit shuffle match is on the way. If UT loses, if Strong Machine J loses, I don't think it means a ton. If if Big Boss Shimizu takes the fall, it doesn't mean a ton, but it does raise my eyebrows a little bit because he's a relatively protected wrestler. On the flip side, you look at Zebrats, and if it's Yo taking the fall, it's probably going to be by the hands of UT, and that sets up your Brave Gate match for Gate of Destiny with Yo and UT, which they've been teasing. If it's Hulk, he's incredibly protected, uh, Kai, same deal. Maybe doesn't mean a ton, but it's certainly eyebrow raising. And Diamante is not taking that fall. There are seven guys that could lose this match, and Diamante is not on that list. There's a lot of possibilities here. It could be a great match in the moment. It could be one of those matches that a month from now, we look back on this and how it really set the table for what's to come. And it's a match that very easily could go no contest as well. <laughs> because I'm looking at the Gale or That is very they- true. That is very true. Yeah, like, I'm looking at the Gayora listing, and it's something that, by now, you think if it was going to be, like, a no DQ all-out war, they have announced it now, We and at least on the Gayora website, and it's duplicated on the Facebook page, I have not seen a mention about it being called an all-out war, so I think that, to me, it seems like that, I think this match is going to go to a no contest, and there will be a bigger stakes with with people who need to be in this kind of match down the that was the verbiage used specifically at Cork and Hall. You're right, the match listing does not have that officially, but with Shun and SB Kento out of the country and with Jason and Jackie busy elsewhere, you are looking at the surviving members of both Vibes and Zebrats all being in this match. So, yes and no, but either way, again, don't be fooled. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's not that I've heard anybody say anything, but this is a big match. This is the business end of the, sh- of the show. And then getting into the uh, three, uh, I don't want to call it films because there's one match here that I think is not that at all. And I think we should probably talk about this one next. It is Kaito Nagano, fresh off his debut. He's doing his full loop here. This is his big show debut. It's against Yazushi Kanda. We didn't have any Dragon Gate uh, live stuff in Japan this week. But Nagano, I have to wonder with like with what we'll talk about in a little bit with people on excursion here. I'm wondering if Nagano maybe kind of feels like that he needs to have a big first big show for appearance here against Yazushi Kanda. I think this is going to be a really fun way to start the show because, you know, Kanda is really good against these rookies. We saw him in the Ahashi brothers debut match last year when Takuma Hayakawa, now uh, 
Minorita, when he debuted, we saw him paired off with Kanda quite often at the beginning of, of this calendar year. Kanda's good in these roles. Nagano has been really exciting. Mike, do you think it's interesting that Nagano and the little bit we've seen of him is working primarily singles matches and less six and eight man tags that they're really giving him a chance to showcase what it is that he does. I think it's something that with his, uh, uh, just with his size, I think like you get him out there and you try to build the crowd connection immediately. And it's easier to do that in five minute squashes where it's five minutes of him versus him getting two minutes in a nine minute, uh, eight man tag on a house show in the middle of Tatori. I completely agree. And then the other matches we do have, because uh, they set up the pop-up shop, uh, Kung Fu Masters, the other two masters, Ho-Ho Loon and Super Shenlong the third, versus two of the original power fighters of T2P and members of Aganiso, uh, Suji Kondo and Toru Awashi here. Uh, I actually can ask this now here, Chaos. Uh, do we think Shenlong's taken the, the, the King Kong lair and seen the lights here tonight? It is an interesting thing to look at because if Ho Ho and Shenlong win, then we really have to reevaluate the future of Kung Fu Masters. I think they're going to take the loss, and and I I weirdly think we're at a point where they'd rather protect Ho Ho than Shenlong. So I think you're right. Shuji Kondo is going to knock out uh, Super Shenlong, and he's going to be looking up at the lights. So the other match we have on the show here, this is going to be your rec league match of the night. It's interesting. I, I've looked both on uh, Facebook and in Gaora. I don't have the Dragon Gate Twitter page pulled up, but one side, no for certain, Ultimo, Ginky Horiguchi, Kenichiro Ryan, Konoma, Ichikawa. And then on the other side, Sachi Okoboy, Takashi Yoshida, Punch Tomonaga, and then I've seen Ryu Fuda and I've seen Mondai Ryu. I'm going to assume it's Ryu Fuda because it, why would you have Mondai Ryu in there when you can give a young guy ring yeah, time? Yeah, this match is uh, not doing it for me. I see on the Gaiora side that it is Problem Dragon listed, which is very disappointing because Fuda would be far more interesting in this spot. But let's try to keep this one under six minutes, boys. Let's get in and out. It, if this individual match, if we're not talking about 20% of the match was actually uh, Separados, then we are kind of doing everyone a service here. Like the, They have to have it so that the ratio of Ultimo coming out, we can't hear everything. For the match itself, I just want to take one last look to see if it's listed as Fuda also on their their Twitter account. So yeah, you can't really discount that. And I think we this is really the most interesting thing about the match is if it's going to be Rio Fuda or Monday Rio. And again, Dangerous Gate is on Monday the nineteenth. It is a national holiday in Japan. So if you're wondering why that's happening there. And I will have the written review up next week. And we'll be back in some form of fashion for Open the Voice Gate to do a long-form podcast review. But that's not all that's on the docket this week on the program case. As we are kind of talking about, there's all kinds of stuff happening in North America with Dragon Gate. And the first thing that I kind of wanted to bring up here was we had the official debut of Takuma Nishikawa on the 8th against Ricky Marvin. And it was put up on the network. Everyone can see it and this is the, like the one guy out of the future class other than nagano being very small that I was able to notify because at least from like his first weekend of being a pro one thing that sets nishikawa apart not just in dragon gate but also seeing him in mexico a couple times he is legitimately big i'm obsessed with this guy because I, I felt like what we learned from the first future class of the Ahashi brothers and Sato and Fujiwara, Fuda and Minorita was that you can't really tell anything from the future matches. I, I really struggled once those guys debuted. I realized, okay, I learned nothing from the exhibitions they worked. I just need to see them as professional wrestlers. So with this second group of guys, I'd watch these matches and and I would kind of just I, I would watch them in the moment and I wouldn't really put any sort of thought into them. So seeing Takuma Nishikawa pop up on my Twitter this week next to Ricky Marvin, who granted not a big man, but to see Nishikawa tower over him and to see how wide his body is and the muscle that he already has, I am obsessed with this kid. Yeah, so this debut, it's a single hard cam uh, from an outdoor venue. And it's here's, 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 here's the note on that. I posted a 
link to a fan cam before the Dragon Gate Network uploaded this video. It's missing like the first 30 seconds of the match, but I think the fan cam might be better quality than the Dragon Gate Network upload. Yeah, no, this was this camera was not on a tripod. Like that is that became very clear that someone was holding this up here. Uh, I like the, the these are the kind of venues I like seeing. It, it, it's very cool to see like people wrestling and then the background. You see the mountains of this. There there was a dog underneath the ring for part of it, but I absolute thought- chaos. It's just I just <laughs> love it. Like I you know now did I spend my entire weekend going back and forth between NFL football and Lucha. Yes, I did. I watched a ton of contemporary Lucha this weekend, partially for the show, partially for fun. I, I have really dedicated myself over the last 18 months to just respecting Lucha for what it is and trying to embrace it as much as I can. Big arena Mexico matches will only do so much for me, but you throw me a grimy Lucha indie with a dog running around and music playing in the background and more people not paying attention to the wrestling that are at the venue than people paying attention to the wrestling. I'm all in. Yeah, no. So the vibe level was off the charts with this match. The match itself, I mean, Nishikawa really in this match, it just like he looked good. Like his fundamentals are good. I kind of, it's something where it's going to be very interesting from him. I feel like I learned a lot more about him, about the IWRG match than I did with him here. And Ricky Marvin decided to work his legs in the ropes for whatever reason in, in a debut match. This was really strong. You know, it's it's the first bit of footage that we're seeing from Nisha Cowling. This was literally his pro debut. He worked those future matches and then he was shipped off to Mexico. And I think my bar for somebody like that is to just not embarrass themselves. And I thought this was a perfectly competent debut match. I thought what he did on the IWRG show was not as strong, but I also think he might have been put into a really unfair environment there. But for a debut match, all I can do, quite frankly, is marvel at the size of this man. And given, you know, the Kameis and the Minoritas and really even the SB Kentos, you know, the size of some of these guys that have come through recently to have another big dude in the fold is pretty exciting for me. And it's something that I guess like it's kind of natural to the IWRG match since we're already talking about Nishikawa. It, it's something that like when I say like he is big and impressive, you like look at them in this uh, impromptu four way tag. This is up on YouTube. Uh, I, uh, Mas Lucha had the show. And they put a lot of stuff up on YouTube. Uh, Shun Skywalker just like ended up showing up at Nakapon and winning a match. And they had him with Nishikawa against three other tag teams, Maximo and Bagamelia, doing the Exotico act. Uh, Dick Angelo, 3G, and Oro, and along with Tomali and Aster Boy. And this was something that really kind of like, in, in a way, I like seeing these kind of things. Like Nishikawa's performance in this match case it is very clear that dragon gate trains you to do like your matches and you do you understand how to do tags and trios this kind of match here fish out of water like you cannot prepare for this kind of thing for him well, absolutely just, i mean it's, it's his second match in front of crowds and he's in like a complex four-way tag i mean if he, if he would have thrived in this environment, I would have been stunned. But this is kind of the result that I would expect if you told me what he was doing in a match like this. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it's something where, like, again, like you, you see him and it's just something that's like, oh, God, I, I feel for him here. And like the sad thing about this is like it's the other side of the coin of like we're getting to see like the first matches of the guy here. This is something five years ago. This match like randomly pops up on someone's YouTube channel like in 2027. Going like, hey, remember that Nishikawa guy? Here's the second match. We would not be seeing it within two days of it happening. No, it's crazy. Again, I, I, you know, it, part of it is just I'm really into this sort of stuff of this guy debuting in Mexico and not really knowing a ton about him. But th- there was somebody that beat the Dragon Gate Network to uploading his debut match, and, and luckily I follow the right Twitter accounts and was able to find it. Like that's that's incredible. This is footage that we shouldn't be seeing. It's footage that Drangate probably doesn't want us to see, other than the debut match, which they obviously uploaded. But the fact that it's out there, to me, is just the greatest thing. And you know, obviously, this was not his match uh, uh, to showcase his skills, even this early in his career. I do think if you watch this match, put a pin in it. Look at where he struggles here. Wait a year, see what he does in Japan. See the first time that he gets put into one of these chaotic tag matches in Drangate. And hopefully we'll be able to see just such 
insane improvement from him. Yeah, like this is a match that like I other than like the novelty of it, I don't think it's really worth putting a whole lot of stock in other than like points of comparison here. Uh, there, there was some big stuff that happened in this match case because Puma Del Oro answered a life or rather a 2022 question of what happens when you decide to tear off Shun Skywalker's shirt in the middle of this and doing a chop battle. Well, Shun will find a way to tie back up his shirt. <laughs> Shun Skywalker seemed to have the time of his life in this match. He got dumped on his head and nearly killed. And 30 seconds later, he was laughing with a fan in the front row about it. Yeah, it, it's something where like you could tell that he was like, oh, yeah, I guess I have time. I I wonder what's happening in Arena Nakapon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me do a vibe check real quick. Right, yeah, and, and then you notice, like, so, so there is this, I know Cubs uh, has gift this, there was a bad bump that, uh, I have to say this, they immediately was like, all right, we're going to eliminate the Dragon Gate tag team to make sure just everything happening. Nishikawa immediately knew, it was like, okay, we're going to get out of here just to see how Shun is. The match continued because uh, Lucha, and uh, <laughs> it, I, I did do a hand gesture when I before I said that. Oh, I heard it. Yeah, so... It's something like that you got to see Nishikawa's composure here. But yeah, no, Shun was just vibing in. It's going to be something for the remainder of the tour. I wonder how many fringe, like, like custom made Zebrat shirts he had they brought with him. And already on the first night, someone's ripping it off to do a chop battle. Yeah, I, I'd love to know if he brought other gear because if you're a newer Dragon Gate fan, like you might not remember there was this point in 2018 and 2019 where Mike was. I would say legitimately concerned that Shun Skywalker's gear budget was too high because he obviously has an elaborate costume with what seemingly looks like a pretty expensive mask. And every show, new colorway. Every show, new design. And I hope he busts out some of that stuff on this tour because he has the chance to. Maybe that's why he did this date was he needed to go get some more gear made. You know, <laughs> He has made event money now. When I was concerned in 2019... <laughs> The, we're talking fresh out of Mochizuki Dojo, Shun Skywalker showing up to a Kyoto show in like a sick looking pearlescent, like blue mask and tights and just never sing it again. I hope yeah, he he'd, do, he'd do the loop. He'd do, you know, blue in Kyoto. He'd do purple in Osaka. He'd do orange in Tokyo and he'd do green in Kobe. And it was just like, this is like, this is different from what he wore last month. How is he just going through this gear so fast? Genki Horiguchi has had like three outfits in 20 years. What is going on? He got a new one. He got a new one. <laughs> yeah, Genki did get new gear. It looked good. Good for him. New gear, Genki. Hey, 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 this is, we did not comment on this before. Uh, Genki, I appreciate the idea of, oh, I'm in my mid 40s. I used to be a surfer. I'm just going to start wearing wetsuits again so I don't have to worry about that anymore. Real it's, pro worker move. Yeah, it, it's it's an old man ring attire. It is, if, if it wasn't obvious that he no longer works house shows and he no longer does anything of importance, Genki's new gear is like, okay, new stage in his career. Got it. If he just decides to have a couple uh, big meals, just zip that bad boy up as far as it goes, and you don't really have to worry about carbs. Foodie, you want to come over here and uh, zip me up real quick? A little, little, <laughs> little tight. <laughs> a, little tight. A, little, a little tight there. Uh, let's stay in Mexico. Uh, in AAA, we had an appearance in Torreon. This is now on their official TV. It was floating around for a while, but now it's officially made a triple a tv show on space this was from the third there were two matches there was a four-way match with sb kento other people in it emperador azteca brazo de oro jr and dinamico and then there was a trios match where they had the babyface side of mr iguana uh, nino amoguesa uh charo negro jr versus la hiedra uh, Bra uh brada carta jr and takuma Representing the heel side there. So we're very clearly already having them kind of positioned on the heel side in AAA in this one appearance. And do you know, I don't I don't know if the Takuma match made TV. There's a handheld of that floating around, but did you see the TV version of this? I saw the TV version of it. I, I know that, and I know that Cubs will let us know. I know that um, that on the space version, because I watched the version that was... Uh, from the the VOD that was a Cubs fan on Lucha to watch it that way, and it was not a part of it. Like they immediately went from that match into more building up uh, Bandito and Flamita. Okay, all right. I, I wasn't sure if the uh, if the Takuma match made TV or not because, like I said, I watched the handheld for both of them, but I knew because AAA posted a picture of Kento Miyahara 
instead of Espy Kento during the match introductions, I knew that that match had made TV. And Cubs, who is already one of the best Twitter accounts of the game, made the astute point of, you're not allowed to laugh at this if you butcher Luchador's names. And I felt like he was coming after my neck with that one. So I quickly shut up. Um, but nevertheless, I, I will say this. Working AAA for these guys is a big deal. Uh, I've been told as such that they're treating this as a really big opportunity for them. It was an uphill battle to get them into AAA. And the fact that they're there now, at least Kento and Takuma, and we'll see if Shun pops up. We'll see if Estrella shows up at some point. I, did Estrella, did he work some house shows for AAA? I thought he did, but the house shows, especially for like AAA and CMLL, they operate on different things here. So it, it, you could work a house show somewhere in AAA, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're being brought on. Yeah, so, so like, yeah. That's something worth saying about the this Torion appearance, but this was something that the amount of effort makes us believe that they'll be brought back or triple a can pull and just like never bring it up again. Like you can go either way with triple a. Yeah. No 50, 50 shot there. But for the kids, this is the big deal. They're taking it really seriously. Their look is great. Takuma as a heel is, is an awesome look. You know, there's that photo going around of he and SB Kento and I forget who the luchador is. And I, and I am so sorry to all of our, our luchador uh, uh, fanatics that listen to this podcast. I don't remember who the third guy is, but they look great. I thought their debuts were really solid. You know, SB Kento was in a four way match and I thought he played his part. Well, I certainly thought he fit in and was capable of working with this roster, but I was more, uh, I guess, astonished is the word that I'll used that I'll use rather as at how good Takuma looked in his AAA debut. And in Mike, tell me if I, if you even register this thought at all, but every time I watch this guy in Mexico, I am just blown away at how natural this all looks for him. I mean, this is, you know, obviously his first time away from Japan. This is his first time working in front of real crowds and whether it's the big Lucha show, whether it was the virus anniversary show, whether it's here in AAA, he just assimilates into these environments so quickly. And it's not an apples to apples comparison, the one that I'm about to make, but you think about like the awkwardness of Kawato's excursion. And you think about all of the bad Japanese matches in Mexico that have gone on over the last, you know, obviously over time, but over the last decade, even with the, with the new Japan guys that have been sent there and other than Hiromu, you know, they haven't really worked out. And then Takuma comes in and it's not that he's having, you know, these Hiromu versus Dragon Lee level epics. I don't know. You know, he, he, I thought his big Lucha match, was his debut there was four stars. But other than that, it's not like he's having great matches. It's just he looks like he belongs. And I'm blown away by that. It's something now that, like, I I feel like that having a couple months away that he's just, like, doing, like, random Lucha shows that be handhelds. And it's just like, okay, I'll get around to that in the catch-up list. You kind of, like... We lost our immunity to, to how just prodigious uh, Takuma Fujiwara is. Like, that's the only word I can kind of put to it. Like, I've already kind of, like, changed my expectations and thrown whatever scale I had out the window with him because he's going out there, and the stuff with him and Mr. Iguana was excellent. Like, those two guys have it together with there. And, I mean, Fujiwara, like, I want to see the TV cut because he, him and Nino Amorgesa, like... He took all of Nino's big stuff there, and boy, that's something that I want to see, like, not just from a fan cam. He's embracing it, and it's something that, you know, I am positive that everyone would be like, we don't want him to just be in Mexico. But given the circumstances, this is exactly what I'd want him to be doing here. And it's something that, you know, every show he gets to do, this is why with the whole hanya mask thing i think it's a overall like a great thing here because we're starting to see more and more each time he goes out there he gets to experience more and you're still in this like phase of him that i mean he's still a literal rookie and he's getting this this experience this exposure and it's only going to pay off fivefold down the road yeah i i you know i don't know i would love to hear from people that watch more lucha than i do mm -hmm. if they've watched these fujiwara matches if they register as being anything impressive because i can only look at it from comparing him to other excursions and i'm just like i said he just never looks out of place he's never in the wrong spot he plays to the crowd he's been in a few different roles he, I, i've seen him work babyface i've seen him work heel i've seen him play to the crowd i've seen him win over the crowd it's just amazing 
what he is capable of doing. He continues to just shift our expectations of him to where, you know, we knew he was going to be a great wrestler, you know, by his first month in the company. It seemed like he was going to be a great baby face for Dragon Gate, but now I want to see him work heel a little bit more because it seems like he he could land back in Japan tomorrow and be a dynamite heel too. Like he's just, he's so good. And it's why for as, as fun as Hook has been and even his contemporaries at Ishinihashi and Mochizuki Jr. for as good as they are, I just don't think any rookie is close to being on his level right now. And it's the thing that I know that when he had like that Jackie funky Kame match, like with there was like, I was already, I was getting a little bit of like calmer horses about like, Oh no, we're, we're experiencing sp- something special in the moment. We have to recognize this here. And he's, comp- I, I mean, you're talking about a guy who's now gone from basically like debuting. I mean, he just turned 20 this year. So debuting as a teenager and was already at a point that he became a significant figure already in one promotion in one country he's gone across the world and doing that at age 20 and it's just something that i know that will be very interesting to see how he progresses in mexico here but it's something that i think you have to give credit that like i know we kind of like oh we kind of missed something with fujiwara not having to send off fujiwara kind of coming and leaving in the middle of the night here but in a way it kind of has worked that it just because of the immunity to Kuma Fujiwara has gone down in the months since he's gone, that I go and watch this trios match here, and you would not think that he's a 20-year-old that is an absolute rookie. No, the, the, the word that comes to mind is ultimately it's abnormal. What he is doing, how quickly he's progressing, and how good he is at 20 years old, if he was 22, if he was 25, it wouldn't matter. He, he debuted in November of last year. He debuted 10 months ago. And he's this good. That's just not normal. And he's just continuing to get better. So I hope AAA uses him. I hope they feature him. I I really think he could be a benefit to any promotion in the world. He could walk in the doors of Gleet, of New Japan, of AEW, of of NXT, Wump, there it is. There is not a promotion in the world that could not use Takuma Fujiwara. And I'm I'm delighted that Drangate has him. And it's something that I think that Kento was perfectly fine in the in a four way in the four way match. It's something that like it, it, it's something. It's like oh yeah, he's here and he did conduct himself very well. But like I like take a step back and I think that and especially comparing it with a match that he would have later on that we'll talk about in a second. You this time more so than other uh, excursions, other Dragon Gate abroad things. We could kind of see like okay. Takuma Fujiwara, I put them, I put him in front of every single crowd, and I know that he's going to be able to be a, to get the crowd on his side here. Whereas with like SP Kento in this random four way here is something that's like this is not the best use of anyone uh, uh, of the opportunity here or the right person to be in this opportunity here, and that's something that'll be kind of an interesting thing to kind of see these fish out of water experiences for like Nishikawa or SP Kento being. Uh, being confused uh, or people being confused about which Kento it is and being put in a four-way match that it's just like, I don't know if that's something that's going to pay off down the line for Kento. Yeah, I really want to see some trios matches with Takuma and uh, Crazy Boy and SB Kento. That That is kind of my goal, whether that happens in AAA or elsewhere, that is really what I want. One place, though, that SB Kento, I felt like, really thrived and... It was from this week. It was ETU, SB Kento versus La Estrella. SB Kento's first match in America. La Estrella has been doing a little bit of MLW. They don't know if it's May tape yet. This is on IWTV. If you subscribe to independentwrestling.tv, it's on their ETU new history. And of course, like the, the one thing that like floated around in the first, like I would say, real buzz that we've got to see for DG and USA has to be the balcony spot that Estrella did on SB Kento coming out of this match. Credit to ETU. I thought the presentation was great. They played a really nice video package before this match. They treated these guys like they were a big deal. The commentary team, which was Veda Scott, and I don't know who the guy was, they weren't experts. They didn't know everything, but they didn't embarrass themselves. And I really liked that at no point did it feel like they were speaking out of depth 
they had a very, I would say, surface level understanding of Drangate and a decent understanding of who these guys were, and that's all they needed. I didn't need anything more from them because I didn't think they embarrassed themselves. So thumbs up on the presentation of SB Kento versus La Australia. Thumbs up for ETU here. They are now the standard going forward for US Indies. I look forward to seeing if anybody can beat them, and I have a bad feeling people will not do as well as them. And the match, you're exactly right. That balcony spot got passed around. In that balcony spot, for anybody that hasn't seen the match, it's up at IWTV. I would recommend watching it because it's short. It's a weird spot that I think looks worse in gift form than it does in the context of the match. In the context of the match, it, it works, and it doesn't look like SP Kento was uh, standing around for too long or wasting time or was overly positioned. I think it actually has a pretty nice flow when you watch the thing from beginning to end. In a GIF, if it's not cut right, it looks a little strange. But in the context of the match, I really like the way it looks. Yeah, and because like that was like my big takeaway from the match was crowd command. Like these guys understood the crowds here. Like remember a couple weeks ago where I said I don't know if I would, I I think that SB Kento or or Takuma Fujiwara in a GCW scramble does not really help him out there. But I think La Estrella actually really would work here. We're starting to see that already of La Estrella and how he's progressed, but. Crowd command here, both for SB Kento and his first time in the States, and La Estrella as an act that does not talk whatsoever, I thought was phenomenal. I think that was a really strong foot. And just echoing what you said, ETU did if every promotion treated Dragon Gate guys in North America like ETU did, I will never complain. Like I thought that Veda Scott was solid on commentary. I think the other guy. His name was Cameron, I want to say. I apologize about that. But it was exactly what we wanted out of it and absolutely no complaints whatsoever. Maybe not have the red light going on the entire time on the show. <laughs> the, 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 that's just me, though. Veda does a good job. You know, I, I like her on those West Coast Pro shows, too. I, I like, I respond well to effort. And Veda Scott is somebody who very clearly, you know, did she take hours to learn everything about these guys? No, but she sat down before the show and at least had a general idea of who these guys are. And I, I appreciate that. Like I said, I think, I think she does well. So uh, good for her. Good for ETU. This is the standard going forward. I hope people are able to beat it, but if they, if they hit this line every time, if black label pro and game changer and deadlock pro, if they're able to present these guys like this, do I think it's going to revolutionize the industry and, and we're going to, you know, go back to companies trying to do faction warfare because of Dragon Gate? No, because ultimately this was like a three and a quarter star match. But do I think they won some fans over? I absolutely did. Oh, it's something that I did not know what ETU was. And now I'm like, okay, if they bring Dragon Gate guys in, I'll, I'll make time to watch it live because I know they're going to treat them, treat them in a way that's not disrespectful. Uh, La Estrella. He came out in this bright red gear. He looked great. It's something that, you know, La Estrella is, seems like he's going his own path for guys at DG and USA, embracing both the good and bad <laughs> of the of living in Orlando. But it's something that, like, so far, I would say after the summer and like this, I, I feel like I've seen a remarkable improvement in La Estrella already. Yeah, he's he's been at the performance center. I it looked like he was at like a a college gymnastics gymnasium a few days ago. He's obviously if you follow him on Instagram and it doesn't bear discussion here, but you know, he is taking the most problematic MMA classes possible. Uh but luckily when he's not doing that, he is training with uh I, what's his NXT name? Joaquin Wild, uh, DJZ, yeah. Z, Zima Ion, who I, I said for years he would be at the top of the list of guys that I would like to see wrestle in Dragon Gate. I think Zima Ion is a brilliant pro wrestler. I think he is unfortunately going to waste in WWE, even though I, by all accounts, he's very happy there. But he has been working with La Estrella, and I see that in his work. You know, Zima Ion's a guy who has tremendous body control. Uh, I think he's a really creative, really unique wrestler, and Estrella seems to be responding well to that. So I, I think he impressed you a little bit more than he did me, but also if we could get to a point in Australia's career where we're not white knuckling every law Australia match, not really sure what's going to come next. That is a victory for everybody involved. And that seems to be the direction that we're heading. Yeah. And it's something that just with like his profile, like I, my mindset was, Oh, this is a guy that I think he actually will get something out of working in the North American Indies. And 
you know, all that entails. And it seems already like him. Yeah. Yeah. Joaquin Wild Z my eye on like seeing like those clips there. I was like, all right, because I think like a primary goal for some of these people on these excursions, not talking about Shunori Yamato here, you know, getting, getting to learn other different people, I think is really helpful. And I think that if it's something that La Stray is getting a lot out of training of Zima on it, it looks like it. I think it's awesome. And it's something that, that, that is one of those things that was really, I, I've been really hoping for Australia and this excursion. And so far I've been nothing but encouraged about everything that's happened with them so far. Yeah, absolutely. So this was a, a sign of things to come. Uh, Mike, do you want me to run over the Drangate in the U S Indies calendar real quick before we go? Yeah, let's do it. So this upcoming weekend at Deadlock Pro on uh, September 17th, it's going to be Jack Evans and Andrew Everett versus SB Kento and Shun Skywalker. This is the match I'm looking forward to most. I think this could be really something special. Yeah, no notes. Like Deadlock, I mean, they've been bringing people over a lot. And this is the kind of match that I think there's enough similarities. I mean, Jack Evans' is family, in a way. You know, I mean, he's a family member that, like, left home and, you know, went oh, went on a wild walkabout. But th there's a common thread there, like Jack Evans and with Dragon Gate, that I could really see that. And Everett is someone that, you know, I'm glad to see Andrew Everett still wrestling, I guess, is my, my opinion on that. Uh, if he picks a spot, he's spectacular. Right, but... yeah. I don't, I don't want him leading this match. I'll say that much, uh, but I hope that's great. Uh, we'll talk about that once we get the footage of it, which I believe will be released a week after the match. Uh, the next day, this Saturday, September 18th, the world of MLW never stops. Court Bauer has been trying for 20 years to book Dragon Gate slash Toriumon guys, and it looks like it's finally going to happen. SB Kento versus Davey Richards, Shun Skywalker versus Myron Reed, another two big wins these of course they're mlw matches so they'll be half as good as they should be but i love these matches on paper i just like the the, the sighting shoot skywalker as a middleweight and that <laughs> sb kento should face davy richards i just like that th that is some balls there and i appreciate it L like like you flip flop those two you flip flop those two nope court bauer is going straight ahead of his idea and i, I do think that the davy matches for like the open weight title or it's an open weight tournament or something yeah sure i, I mean well, i don't know i i don't know the world of yeah. lw never stops but i can't find their fucking footage anywhere i don't a lot of australia worked there in june i don't think that footage is aired yet i mean weren't they going on hiatus like the I, I like don't this know. Whole, like for a while case it seemed like the court bowers dream was going to continue again like the dream would not be he would not reach his dreams but it does seem like i mean there's still a lot of time between now and the 18th, to be honest. That's the thing. If for some reason the Dragon Gate guys don't work this show, I'm very afraid of the reality in which they would appear on an MLW show. Like, I would be scared for the, the fate of the world. I think climate change would finally snap if Dragon Gate wrestlers worked at a Corp Hour show. So if it doesn't happen this weekend, I hope it never happens. But I like these two matches on paper, so I am hoping that it happens. Yeah, no, the, the, it's something that... I mean, for Myron Reed, he's someone that I know you've been high on for a long time with him and Shun. And then, hey, I I, I feel like Cord's booking for us with Davey here. Do you, do you think he is there? I mean, do you think that he listened to all 50 episodes of Rewind and Rewatch? Court Bauer's a big fan of the show. Open the voice gate. I, this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell that girl that. You know you know who Court Bauer is? World of the MLW <laughs> never stops. He's a big fan of the show. Our friends I, at Manscaped I, say so. Have you checked it on BN Sports, all the various ways to watch MLW Wired? <laughs> a little BN Sports and chill, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right after that, you get to have, you'll get you be able to see the FC Barcelona C team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not the A team. Not, not the primary backups either. We're talking about the under 23. Come on over. Make yourself comfortable. I'm going to flip on BN Sports for us, all right? That's... <laughs> <laughs> self-comfortable okay <laughs> I, I i i want to see one if i get being sports right now and two if what is on being sports usa right now because i feel like it has to either be soccer or mlw right i i would assume so i mean i have i have a fire stick here and it, admittedly i haven't dug in to see if they've got the being sports app or not i'm I, i'm watching 2006 dragon in the background so i'm not going to flip over but i would love to know what your being situation 
All right. So not only is there being sports, there's being sports extra. And <laughs> hey, hey, they, we, why are why are we not doing open the voice get extra? It, I mean, I have zero free time to give to any more wrestling related projects. <laughs> but if BM Sports <laughs> can have a second channel, we are morons for not doing a second. They have channel. four case. They have four channels. Four. What the? Well, well, oh. well, two of them are Spanish language. Two of them. Okay. Are all right. All right. I'll. I'll. Well, at some point, you know. We're just going to have Ricardo uh, from Voices of Wrestling just dub over our voices with a Spanish translation. I think that actually that might be a good business move, actually. So right now, welcome to Qatar on BN Sports. Uh, on BN Sports Spanish, it is Huner versus uh, Flamingo from the uh, Copa Libertadores. That is the South uh, American club championship between all the countries that's going on there. And then not even... Not even Eurobasket, not even Euroliga. This is Super League Review, sports but non-event. Uh, Besiktas versus Istanbul, Basakir, and then soccer, Camino a Qatar, on being sports Spanish extra. Right now, sounds, that sounds horrible, but nevertheless, the world of MLW uh, uh, doesn't stop. I mean, imagine like what guys are on Besiktas uh, basketball team. Like there has to be like someone who was like a Georgia Tech washout that was like the best player in Georgia Tech, but could not land anywhere. But now is playing basketball in Turkey. It's like the like Drew Parker in Big Japan, where it's just like, well, nothing else worked. But for some reason, this does. So this is what my life is now. Absolutely. Well, Case, I think that's going to do it for us. No, no, this... no, 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 oh. no. I've got, I've got more dates for you, Mike. I've Sorry. got two more shows I want to talk about. Uh, next week, September 24th, Black Label Pro in Crown Point, Indiana. I got to thank my man, BLP Mikey. I've been very critical of him in the past. I don't think he puts on a good product. I think his shows are largely very unprofessional. He went out there and he said, Shun Skywalker's available. It's about a, th- it's a really, uh, unpleasant drive if case from the open the voice gate podcast wants to make the trip to this show brother don't worry about it i'm booking him against space monkey nothing for you to see here and that's nothing against space monkey that's just i'm not driving hours to see shun skywalker versus space monkey and a bunch of and a bunch of <laughs> other matches that i don't like so mikey we don't see eye to eye on everything thank you brother you just saved me an entire day in the car and i really appreciate it Hey, it's nice just to give us a sign right off the bat that this is just not worth it. If Dragon just, guys I'm, show- I'm, brother, I'm good. I, I yep. don't need this in my life. I appreciate it. Thank you for not doing like Shun versus Jake something where then I've got to scratch my chin and I've got to text Rich Crage and go like, oh, you know, we go. Uh, we, we could make it we you know we could make a day trip out of it you know crown point it's 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 lovely this time of the year nope you said i'm booking him against space monkey you have nothing to worry about you stay home you enjoy your weekend don't spend any extra time in crown point i appreciate it thank you for doing what you do and continuing to book wrestling that is entirely unappealing to me i greatly appreciate it whereas prestige wrestling in portland this is a month out this is october 30th but i have to mention this show while we're doing this little roundup SB Kento versus Kevin Blackwood has been announced for that show already with talent already named, including La Estrella, Yamato, Commander, Black Taurus, Alex Shelley, the American Wolves, and Danger Aaron from Jackass. That is a marquee event. Props to Prestige Wrestling. I am into that show. How much convincing do we have to do to get La Estrella versus Danger Aaron? That's, God, it just, it just seems like Australia's gonna hurt himself in that match. Like, like Australia's that weird case of being athletic but not athletic enough, and I just see him taking a tumble <laughs> in that match. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's something now where I'm not terrified when Australia is going up for a dive or basing for or catching someone. It's like, oh god, something bad will happen here. But with Danger Air and it very much, we can reintroduce that right back into my bloodstream. I just thought, like, like I just had like three minutes of being like, La Australia, I'm really excited and proud of what he's doing no i want to see him against danger and just go back i want to see yamato and shelly versus the american wolves i wonder if we can make that happen doesn't that sound really good yeah you know that's a match i would go out my way to go see yeah 
I don't know what the state of Eddie Edwards' body is. I don't know if he has dreadlocks. I don't know if he's wearing basketball shorts. I don't I don't know what his deal is. I haven't seen him in quite he a while. He does have braids. He does have braids. I did watch an episode of Impact when I was Fuck in Chicago. Yeah. That's what a fascinating career he's had. He is just this, like just, you know, like Davy, Roddy, and Eddie were just like these guys. And Eddie Edwards has now been in Impact Wrestling for a decade. And for a large chunk of that has been like a personality guy on the roster. They basically made him the new Tommy Dreamer by feuding with Tommy (laughs) Dreamer. (laughs) Like, it's just, it's weird because once, once he left my like, like line of vision, which was like 2014 ish when the wolves and the Hardys had those, those really good matches. Like after that, I just don't know what this man has done. I see a picture of Eddie Edwards like once every five months and I have to go, wait, who is that? And then they tell me it's Eddie Edwards. And I go, no, it's not. He looks insane. And it turns out to always be Eddie Edwards. Remember like he had like this like near five-star match of Cano in the middle of this too? Oh my God. I forget. He, he was GHC heavyweight champion, wasn't he? I would love to case. Like, I feel like that it... We we would we would just have to like brown nose the right people. I feel like the two of us should have like a series, and it, and, it, and it's only going to happen occasionally. And what it is is we get the two of us in a room with like Eddie Edwards, and we just go like through his career choices with him because I want to hear the logic of being like, hey, me becoming the new Tommy Dreamer. That sounds great for me, brother. That's exactly what I want. So. August 26, 2017, Eddie Edwards beats Nakajima for the GHC heavyweight title. He goes on to defend the belt against Marifuji at one of their big Yokohama shows. Also on that show, Moose and Yuji Okabayashi versus Nakajima and Masa Ketamiya. He defends of <laughs> no notes. He defends the belt against El Hijo del Fantasma at an impact show. And then he has that Kano match on december 22nd 2017 in corkin they did 1615 for that which for 2017 noah that's a great number for 2022 noah that's oh my god they'd kill themselves for that i mean they would they would sacrifice kiyomi at the stake to do 1615 with mood on top (laughs) they would love nothing more and uh third from the top on that show takashi segura versus moose perfect no notes yet again no the, th- the the thing is moose in japan was always fun like there the the first ring of honor new japan shows that they did in Corkin, moose was probably the biggest star on those shows in terms of the reaction of the roh homegrown guys and then he bounced to noah it. well i mean yeah he's a former nfl player who did the moose chant which got over there and then he looks the way he does which is always always a plus like yeah made sense i should also note before you give any further moose comments the show where eddie won the ghc title on the undercard two matches back to back quiet storm versus cody hall and cano versus leona perfect yet again no (laughs) no it's i look it's got to be hard being a lucha fan cubs had a tweet last week that made me really sad talking about how uh cmll drew you know ten thousand fans and had this lively atmosphere and nobody wants to talk about it it's hard being a lucha fan it's got to be so much harder tying your boat to noah and just the the turmoil over the last 10 years that that company has been through all of the different phases all of the different ownership all of the all of the different everything oh it's got to be so hard it's i mean so let's have a joint show here in november Yamato versus Siki Yoshioka. That's a- I. I can't. I. I'm, I'm so annoyed that Yamato's on that show. I talked about it at last week. I am. I have only gotten more annoyed that Yamato is working that show and he's working who he's working. I. Oh, it just. I'm sure. I'm sure the match will be fine. I am just stunned that they are making their five time Open the Dreamgate champion, the face of their company, work a show that is so far beneath them. I, I think by the time this show happens in November, I will probably have you in a froth. It's just, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It, look, if they were running the show on October 30th when all of these guys are in America, I would get it. But the fact that 
they're building the show around Yamato and that the November Cork and Drangate standalone show will likely outdraw this, the joint show. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I don't get it. Yep. Well, that is a problem that we'll have for November. We have a lot of stuff coming up for Dangerous Gate. Case, anything else you want to say? This time, I, I, this time, I don't think there's any other Dragon Gate in USA things. I'm interrupting you for the outro. I apologize about that. No, all good. I am officially out of things to talk about. All right. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. Case is that underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to Open Voice Gate. We'll be back next week talking about Dangerous Gate. Take care, everyone.